so we're a company that does a lot of integration in financial services uh, domains and of course we get the demand uh, to get into the DSLs and in some cases it makes our life easier um, inside to try to uh, keep up with the clients and in a lot of cases the clients need these DSLs to make their lives uh, easier so uh, what I'm going to give you is a sort of rather pragmatic view of uh, what we've got. I'll give you some uh, some idea of the sort of this is going to work yep the sort of clients <clears throat> We've got the vast majority of the world's large investment banks um, and central clearing houses, and uh, that's just a, a bunch of them. Another company of ours, we have over 200 hedge funds in these doing high frequency trading fixed engines. So we've got a lot of uh, a lot of good customers here, as you can see. Um, many of these we've had for well over 10 years. We do put the vast majority of all SWIFT messages through um, for payments. We've got a lot of uh, FIX, um, FPML, ISO 2022, etc. in there. So, I want to give you a sort of a viewpoint from uh, these. Um, why do we need DSLs? Uh, I'm going to give you a few slides of some of the headaches that we have in this uh, domain. Uh, we've got dozens and dozens of different formats. Uh, it's not simply XML. We've got um, tag value pairs. We've got a lot of binary. We get into the telcos. It's all binary. I know this is financial services. But uh, we have um, ISO 8583, for example, in the, in the card collections. We've got uh, people still using or, or even potentially using ASN.1. We've got probably close to the, the majority of non-XML messages in uh, CSV format. So these are all formats that we have to handle and there's no way they're going to go away. Out of that, we've got dozens of standards. And even if you take those individual standards, you take FPML, for example, there's a good part of 80 different versions of FPML. And not one single bank uses any one of those um, versions. What they use is small parts of that because it is effectively a metadata repository. Um, the ISO 2002 is now, uh, they've released a version, they just forgot to put in SEPA, so they're going to have to reintroduce yet another version, uh, probably yeah, this week. Put in what? Oh, they forgot it. Just yeah, put in what? SEPA, the Single European Payments Area. So it's just, um, it's just a little patch release they're going to have to do. Uh, but and it, there's, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of versions, and it's only just been such a short duration that nobody would have used it yet. But of each of these, there's lots and lots to keep up with. Um, and the multiple different versions and this is just part of what you see and in real life you're going to get not just these standards the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these standards but all of the other proprietary standards internally as well um, the investment bank markup language IBML was introduced wise and used internally in JP Morgan Chase you've got the same in Goldman Sachs you've got the same in a number of these uh, different uh, companies that use their own uh, proprietary um, service, but they're often based on, for example, FPML or ISO 2022. Uh, what we do, incidentally, as a company is basically provide all these out, off the shelf, out of the box, so the, the companies can basically support every single one of these standards. So to give you an idea of the domain, if we look at a, a typical investment bank as a sort of functional uh, aspect, uh, reading down, we've got front office, middle office, the last part here, and then back office, finance, etc. As the trades go through, You've got your, uh, not in an investment bank, but you've got, you don't tend to have the high frequency traders there in the hedge funds, but you've got traders up on the top here. Um, you've got accounts and such going down here. And then finally, uh, could be in the US several days later, but in uh, some of the more uh, financially savvy countries, um, this may happen same day. Um, the US is particularly slow at processing these sort of things. But if we look at one particular transaction, um, isolating some of these out, um, I know you can't read those from the back. So we've got uh, trading, uh, matching, uh, allocation, block allocations, etc., uh, interface management, uh, risk control, all the sort of things you'd expect to find. We look at those transactions as they go through. This is one single transaction. Uh, we've got fixed messaging. Typically, uh, we don't have time for the brackets, so we've got a lot of fix in there. Uh, that fix is even encoded into fast. Uh, fast is basically just the, the little deltas and upgrade updates on those which again is compressed in a sort of binary format. Then you've got fix, then you've got fixml. Then we get down into fpml, we've got lots of comma delimited files, which basically are, are dumps, imports, exports, uh, into and out of um, databases, naturally, relational databases. And then finally, as we get down, we get past the sort of comma delimited files, and then finally, as we come out of here, we're gonna get out. We've got interfaces to other banks out of here to, to uh, match the trades, um, fpml quite typically. Um, and then finally up here we've got proprietary formats like SWIFT, which is uh, an ISO standard as well. Take that, that's just for one location, 
you've then got to multiply that by all the different uh, locations, each one of those with their own proprietary standards. Um, US with a bunch of proprietary standards internally with all of the different states and the way they work. Uh, Europe, each again with each of the individual countries, um, perhaps um, working towards some sort of unification, but um, I'm going to get into that in a second. And then Asia Pacific, which again was another delight of huge number of different types of messages, again striving towards an ISO 2002 type standard, but uh, a long way off uh, unification on that yet. All of these then have to speak to each other, so even if you solve the problem here, uh, these banks still talk to the other banks in different geographic locations. So this is one bank, but these banks then talk to another few hundred different banks, and of course you've got all of the corresponding messages. And add all of the different standards in those, add all of the different versions of all the different standards of those, and you create yourself a, a, a fairly big nightmare. And you, you're looking at, you know, in the sort of high thousands, uh, low tens of thousands of different types of messages to be able to, to understand one single transaction as it typically goes through your system. So uh, it's great for us because we're a business and this is what we sell it to, so the more standards, the merrier, and it just keeps the business rolling, which is good. I said 2022 is a um, probably the best effort so far to try and consolidate some of these. Um, this is not; it doesn't define single messages. Uh, if you look at FPML, it defines because some attempts to define different types of message. So you've got your swaps, your interest rate derivatives, your um, foreign rate agreements, etc. And they're defined as messages, and they're made up of part of the repository, which is which is very good. And a lot of banks have used this as their. Um, standard, but ISO 2002 goes some stage further. Um, it, it makes a very good attempt at defining uh, the, the different types uh, within trades throughout the, um, the, the banking, uh, as, as your trade moves from the front all the way through the STP process, ideally through to settlement at the back. But if you take the very latest standard, uh, we have a count of 49,209 uh, elements in there. Uh, just if you want to see that as, uh, and again, it's not a message, so there's no root, but if you take all of the elements and you put them into one of the uh, typical XML spy oxygen, something like that, you'll find 49,000 elements and there's 8,700 different types, meaning those are the types that you've got to map to. So it still gives you some sort of headache. So even if you create a DSL, the DSL has got to sort of refer to all of these different types and you've got to take your common delimited file and then refer that across to these types. So there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, if you take the requirements to an extreme, um, at one end you've got the, the Java programmers, um, the R programmers, the, uh, the people programming the, um, the various different cards, the GPUs and all the sort of bits and pieces. So we've got the geeks down at the, the bottom end with the FPGA cards and, and such. And at the other end you've got your um, business people right at the top. Um, Unfortunately, they, they tend to sit and view the world in Excel. And it is their business, however. These are the guys that at the end of the day, you want to get some money out of them. You've got to get these guys at the top um, to pay your, your bills. And that's whether you're working in academia or something, eventually somebody's paying your beer and pizza money or the university or the accommodation, the flights and everything else. So these are the guys you really want to sort of get attracted. These are great to work with, and they're the people that I prefer to sit with, and uh, we can sit and uh, talk about the sort of internals of this stuff. But uh, we need some sort of mapping between these, and if we provide uh, DSLs um, within these, um, it's got to come up at this sort of end because these guys really don't have the time or want to learn something, particularly if it's proprietary, because they tend to move around jobs every uh, six months to, to two years, and the last thing they want to do is learn something proprietary, which doesn't really help them in their uh, their next job. So, one of the solutions certainly that we came across, this is a long time before we got into sort of looking at DSLs, we were trying to solve the problem. So we took a lot of these messages. Uh, there were some technologies uh, back in the early 2000s. One was called Caster. There was a technology called JaxB, JivX. And what they do is take XML, what was originally DTDs, and schemas, and they take the definition of a schema and they basically can create Java code. There are mapping tools which do the same, JPA, for example, Java Persistence Architecture, which do the same for a database and basically create Java so you can map in and out. At the end of the day, the vast majority of banks, way over 90, probably way over 95% are using Java or Linux, Linux sitting in the back end as their sort of predominant architecture. 
So we thought if we could take these common delimited files, if we could take these proprietary formats and we could map them or define them in some sort of way and create the same Java, we could actually map these back across to the original standards which are predominantly defined, although some of them are in UML originally, they don't tend to publish them in UML because nobody understands UML in banks, it's only a, a few elite that understand it. And so if you start circulating UML amongst the, the programmers, the elite guys go, this is the way we should be doing it, but nobody else can understand it. So there's no communication and you end up having to use schema again, as uh, Matthew Warlings and I discovered. Um, um, so what we need, what we can now do is to get um, these down towards Java binding, but this now gives us a tool that we can ex start to extend. So from the Java, we can now start to build on top of this and we can start to look at building different sort of um, DSLs. Now, I've just um, narrowed down to sort of four different versions here, and I'll to cover some of those bits quickly. Now, we work in the integration space. Um, particularly, uh, Jean-Marc was going through the, um, his product earlier, and I was thinking, the thing you've got to do with this is integration into the outside world and to other clients and things, I'm so I need to speak to you after this as well. Um, but. We work in the integration space, so these are the sort of things we see. We see how to define messages, we see how to define transformations, we see how to define routing, and ultimately our clients are looking at putting these into big data, to use the lovely word, um, Hadoop um, in a large case, and also they're doing matching reconciliation systems where you've got several hundred thousand or millions and even billions of, of trades or messages that you've got to be searching through. And they're looking for mins, max, and all those sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. Um, the, when it comes to defining the messages, the vast majority of today's modern messages are defined either using UML or schema. And the, the one that gives us the biggest headache is classic Swift, triple, is ISO 7775. Um, and we have a, we've been selling this since 2002. Um, a lot of those clients are there are still using that. This is an example of a Swift message. It's uh, MT108, uh, so it's uh, no, it's an MT103. So it's basically a Swift message. We already defined this. We went to some pain to read through it. It's not defined in any computer readable language. Uh, it's defined in PDFs. Uh, it's a part about this big, and you have to read through the PDFs and you have to implement those um, by defining your own model. And we did that. And when Swift change it, they give you another part of PDF, so there's no diff between them. So you have to read through the same set of PDFs, implement them both in the same way, and then do a diff to find out hierarchically what the difference is between the messages, which is good fun. So we tried using, uh, the, the, the furthest we got with this, because we thought we'd try and get a little, you know, it would help us, the furthest we got was using Antler, um, hence some of the questions I was asking earlier in uh, usage on this. We looked at Yak, Lex, and various different things. But to be honest, at the end of the day, this is a this is definitely a legacy standard, um, and we we basically dropped that, and so we have kept the existing implementation. But I just want to give you an idea of the sort of language you need to define on this. This, looking at this, it doesn't look particularly nice, but believe me, it's horribly more complex than this. There are some really nasty rules about whether you've got one of these fields, you can't have one of the other fields, and if you've got one of those, you must have an intervening uh, currency. And those rules are not provided in a and machine readable no, format? No, not provided in any machine readable format. They're part of the PDFs, which you have to then search through, and uh, and they often don't refer naturally to the messages, they refer to sequences, and sequences are part <coughs> of the message, et cetera, et cetera. We could sit and go through an awful lot of beer discussing that as well, <laughs> as we have done many times. Um, now, when I submitted a proposal to do this, I, I mentioned XPath, and there was a, hey, you can't mention XPath, it's not a DSL. But I, I beg to differ. XPath used as, on XML, no, it's just another language for, for accessing part of uh, XML. But if you can convert your binary and your common delimited files into something which you can now navigate using XPath and XQuery, you can now define, for example, one column in a common delimited file as being greater than or less than or 20% of or something of another column in a common delimited file, or the four bytes within a 32-bit um, integer. Um, by masking it and right-shifting it down, you can actually put that and you can access it now using <coughs> XPath. That, for me, is, is a relatively useful DSL um, in financial services to be able to access the content, content of these messages. 
But remember at the end of the day, a trade is the same trade going right the way through the system. There's different information that's needed as it goes through. So if someone is taking, um, doing a trade, the trade has uh, multiple allocations within a block. Um, they're all added together. Um, and that block is part of maybe a portfolio, and that portfolio is then netted, and then finally there's a settlement that goes on the back. So any part of the bank, as you move through, you can see the same trade, you see the same dates, the same counterparties, the same payments, the same amounts, and the same quantities. If you can access that in the same way all the way through, uh, whether it be a fixed message, a CSV message, uh, ISO 20022 or PML, that actually simplifies uh, the work all the way through. And that would again apply to the model if you can actually export, um, as you suggested, as XML, then we can access the same information all the way through. And we can now apply this towards our metadata repository that we got. And this ideally is ISO 20022 or, or quite traditionally FPML. When it comes to the transformations, we haven't found any better way than uh, graphical. Um, to, to a certain exception, there are, if you go to a, a Java shop, getting again Java programmers to do anything other than programming Java or Scala or any of the other interesting languages uh, they don't want to use GUIs it's proprietary they don't want it so um, we provide two alternatives it's basically you either write it in code or you do the graphical interface but we haven't found any uh, DSL uh, that simplifies this however these this is effectively functional so you can click on these and you can drill down and you can drill down into multiple levels and you can you can make this look neat uh, a transformation badly programmed looks horrible and so you need to start to make this a little, little neater and inside these we can now define our own uh, DSLs within the functions so that makes it actually quite useful as well so the clients effectively put this into production we got messages which we've read in here maybe common delimited files part of a database part of an FPML message for example and the output here may, be, may well be Murex, Calypso or some internal canonical format uh, that they're mapping to and so inside there are DSLs, but we haven't found a better solution other than graphically. And so a very large number of uh, those banks that you saw earlier are using this in production, have been for a good 10 years or so. When it comes to um, actually doing the message transformation and the message routing, this is a core part um, of any of the integration that's happening. This is just an example. A message comes in, it could be picking up off an MQ series queue, Tipco, Rendezvous, uh, could be a, a message arriving on a socket, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, effectively, we need to acquire that message. It may come uh, zipped, tarred, uh, it may come as a batch, it may come as an individual message. So we need to acquire that. Typically, that's uh, we use the bank's uh, ESB. It could be uh, Fuse, Camel, Mule, um, the Oracle, um, BA, what was uh, Aqualogic, um, all of these different um, tools that we can acquire, there's spring, spring integration, etc. We need to pass the message. If you can't pass the message, you can't understand the content of it. If you can't understand the content, there's no point in having a DSL because you need to apply your language and rules and uh, instructions on the content of the message. So you have to pass it. Validation, you could call it optional. Uh, I don't mean validation against the schema. This is the validation of the nasty parts of the message that are the constraints of the message. The settlement date must absolutely be past the, the trade date, or at least the same as or past the, the trade date. So these are, in many cases of the standards, these are mandatory uh, validation. And then finally we've got routing. Routing is, is absolutely vital. You cannot, we don't work in a single um, environment where you've got one machine. We've got a distributed architecture here. We have slicing, we need to move it around. Uh, we need to take out all the messages which are useless. If, uh, if we can aggregate some of those messages, we can reduce the amount of memory we need uh, while, we'll do, while we're putting these into a distributed, uh, distributed cache, distributed memory, we can reduce the amount of memory we need. So it's absolutely vital to be able to do this routing as well. And then finally, those go into some store. Now store, particularly in the areas we work, tends to be in memory, tends to be distributed in memory. It's the Oracle coherence, what used to be Tangosol, the gigaspaces, gem fires, the um, hazel cast, all of these sorts of big memory caches. So these are the sort of things that we're doing. But the more you can do in terms of routing and filtering, the less goes in here and the less uh, extra work you have and the less garbage collection. Um, last year we worked with the uh, what was VMware, which is now Pivotal, um, and we created a um, Scala, or 
together we created the Scala DSL that sits on top of um, a spring integration. And this gives uh, it's sort of a more of a sort of integration centric DSL that allows um, people to pipe their messages around. So a typical workflow of picking up off the files, pulling it at a rate of uh, every thousand milliseconds, um, doing transformations, and then finally putting it into a MongoDB template, MongoDB as a and NoSQL uh, type of uh, database. Uh, this was released last year. It's in the public's it's open source, uh, public domain. So. Uh, plenty of examples out there that, that work with this. Um, when it comes to exposing these to clients, um, what they're really looking for is, um, they're basically looking for an Excel spreadsheet. That's the only thing, unfortunately, that the business people understand. If they're in anything other than Excel, they're not going to be working in a boring bank um, pushing Excel spreadsheets around. Um, so, um, this, where's this video going? They're not going to see it ever, are they? So we, <laughs> so this is the sort of slightly lower intellectual uh, level. These are the uh, managers in the banks, but unfortunately they're the ones that sign the checks. Um, so it's fairly easy to actually take these min, max, sums, uh, etc. Uh, what we did was to take those out of Excel and we introduced the Bollinger Bands, um, standard deviations, moving averages and bits and pieces, all of the sort of stuff which I'd really like to <laughs> All the sort of stuff that you've obviously done way, way further than, than what we've done on this. But this is basically we do it on when a client asks for something, we do it and they pay us, and uh, we follow client demand. Um, and this this works pretty nicely. And uh, this is probably the single most popular usage we get uh, in terms of defining DSLs um, for people taking trades off a fixed engine, looking for algorithmic trading, uh, looking for. Uh, rules engines, CEP, complex event processing, and particularly now as we can distribute these in a big data environment, we can start to get a distributed uh, complex event processing in combination with these in-memory um, databases. It's, it's pretty powerful because it's not limited to one machine and what the power of that single machine can do. Uh, performance has been quite uh, interesting here. Uh, when I talk about Java binding before, if we take an XML, um, remember the 49,000 elements, the 8,700 8, different types. Now that generates 8,700 different types of uh, different Java classes, and each of those internally have a string, an int, and a, a float, and all the other bits and pieces. And that generates a hell of a lot of garbage as your messages come in and out. Um, and so, what we've done for some of the higher performance, obviously, when you get to the middle and back office, nobody really cares quite so much about performance. Yes, they do if they're um, calculating. Uh, value at risk calculations, etc. on the calculations, but they don't so much about pushing the processing through. So on the high performance side, and we're talking um, front office trading, we're looking at the CME on a single channel hit 380,000 messages a second. Um, so we're looking at that sort of range. Uh, if we don't hit that, then the messages, so if we only manage 300,000 and it hit 380,000, those 80,000 messages are either lost or they're in a backlog and we've got to catch up sometime and it, it doesn't just drop like that in performance, it goes down. So we have a window where we have to fit the triangle that didn't fit in and the other side to process and then we get a delay and if we've got a delay, we've got latency and latency doesn't work because it's that point when you've got the 380,000 that you need to do the trade, not a few seconds later when you finally processed it. So it's absolutely critical in the um, outside of the domain in the, in the telcos, getting similar sort of message looking at uh, 7 to 12 billion uh, messages a day and that's a constant, uh, in some cases 36, uh, 24 hours uh, a day, 3,600 3, seconds per hour. Um, what we've had to do now um, is we take the messages, we do what's called lazy parsing where we'll put the message into a byte buffer, we'll keep it in memory um, and we'll actually do, since you don't typically need to parse the entire message, we'll actually find the part of the message that we want, pick out the data um, in at runtime, uh, so the get is, and we can part of that you can cache, but basically we get the message uh, out of that. We've moved performance now up to um, far in excess of a million messages a second per call, uh, which quite adequately covers these sorts of requirements. What it's done is pass the headache of the performance down to the dynamic routing. So if you remember going back to the routing, somebody's now saying um, on a on an hourly basis, oh, I want all of the trades, the Euro trades that are over 10 million in that box there, or I want to dynamically repartition these uh, drives because that machine's not working or that's getting rather hot uh, usage, so I want to dynamically move these. 
when you start to dynamically query these, yes, we've got the very high performance getters, but what happens when you create a, a dynamic routing when you say um, price greater than something is it's basically using Java reflection, and Java reflection halves the performance of this. It's about 700 nanoseconds for a Java reflection. And so by the time you put in two queries in there, you've actually halved the performance and went back down close to this sort of 500,000 a second very, very quickly. And again, if we can't keep above that, we're, we're in serious um, latency territory. If we can keep on that, we, we keep the latency down. So what we've now done is uh, we started to compile this um, same sort of thing that's been uh, talked about before. So we now um, we look at how much it's been used and we can compile this directly down to code. Java 1.6 now has a built-in compiler, so we can compile this. You essentially compile it while all this is going on. Yep. Yeah. And the hood, as was mentioned earlier, there's a you know, fraction of a second um, for uh, compiling it, but compared with the time somebody's typing it in, it's, it's negative. So it uh, goes straight in, it's picked up, uh, we do a cluster four name, load it up, it's picked up, it's uh, optimized by the uh, just in time compiler, and it, it's effectively native code. Yes. And the compiled code does not use reflection anymore, directly defines to Yep, there's no reflection at all. And this is also some of the work we've been doing with um, partners, for example, Pivotal, the Spring guys that we work with very closely. They're now doing the same with uh, some of their dynamic uh, routing because we need to keep up with these sorts of things. And it gives us a whole new opportunity in, in this sort of area uh, in the Java side. And as has been said before, we can compete quite readily with the C, C++ on this. So finally, um, that's pretty much the last slide on this. What I wanted to point out, and uh, I, I was writing these slides as the chap sitting at the back will confer as we were sort of uh, over lunchtime and things, and there's a lot of uh, French in here. Uh, one of the things that was uh, I thought was amusing was driving this. Um, SEPA is the single European payments area, and it's basically um, driving all of the Eurozone countries to to adopt this one standard because they each have uh, CIPOM, but for example, in, in France, and they have to basically each, each one's got a different payment, but under European law, you cannot uh, dis distinguish uh, or favorite any one country over another. So if you buy, you're in Spain and you buy a car from Germany, you should be able to take a bank loan from Italy. Not that Italy would be a good place to take a bank loan from. But, um, so you basically has to be the same price right across the Euro region. Now each of those countries has a different standard that's been around for hundreds of years and they've now got to consolidate these into, um, into ISO 2022 based SEPA. Uh, again, the single European payments area is what it stands for. And this came out last month, um, in fact, August. Um, basically, uh, it says um, six months to go, 1st of February 2014, the enterprises have to merge all of their uh, different payment mechanisms into SEPA. And uh, apparently, uh, where's the number? 86% of them haven't got there yet. And they've only they've got less than four months to do that now. the first time they've established a deadline. No, um, and a lot of these deadlines in 2008 were moved. But uh, another one, obviously, that we come across hugely in uh, in this country and in Europe and in uh, Pacific Asia is, is the Dodd-Frank compliance. And, uh, for example, even the Japanese banks, uh, the European banks have to file their um, swaps um, derivatives with, uh, for example, the DTTC. I have not really a question, but uh, just to, to thank you very much. That's fascinating, interesting, and uh, I can only confirm that, of course, I have not the same overview that you have, uh, but with my little eyes, I have seen so much subsets of everything time, yeah. you, you told us. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what happened. Yeah. And uh, uh, trying to get into the French market at the moment is horrible. They're just not buying anything. It's just yeah. sitting there and waiting for something to happen. You can see the sort of. Uh, yeah, no, I have read, I, I remember when I read yeah. this in the decor. Awesome. Yeah, I just found it earlier, and I, <laughs> when I heard you speaking, I just thought I should. Uh, but this, this is what's driving the business, and it's, it's, the, it's the regulatory reporting, it's, it's really pushing it forward. So. Could you bring up the slide with the um, graphical transformation editor? Yeah. Yeah, that can there. The boxes are the function. Yeah, so are attached to the mapping. What happens uh, effectively? You, you've imported the models. Uh, you, each of these have got right. constraints. Right. I would now right click, and I would have a list of um, perform lookup, go to command line um, function, and in the functions I'd have textual functions, uh, 
uh, aggregate functions, um, mathematical functions, etc., and a list of my own functions. Um, and each of those I click on. So, for example, uh, you can see them here, concat, for example. So we've got two inputs here. Um, and these also would be, if I double click on them, I could go further down in, into those. Well, that really is a step above the typical graphical transformation GUI that you get with the ETL, you know, the ETL that that definitely what you would produce is more powerful there. Yeah, I mean, what, have the, what, what this produces at the end is uh, it produces a jar for this, a jar for this, one for this, and one for this. Those jars actually validate the inputs and the outputs, and it generates another jar for the transformation. And you just load it up in your favorite TSB Java and load up three inputs, execute the transformation, and you get the output. Jars? Uh, sorry, jar, jars are the uh, libraries uh, produced by uh, Java. So. I know what that's jars, but uh, those are just, I thought those were just data formats. No, it's a data format. So, uh, take an example. This is a comma delimited file. So, we'd load up the comma delimited file. Uh, if it had headers, great, because it gives us the names of the columns as opposed to A, B, C, D, E, uh, And with that, we would say this is a date, this is an integer, this is a float, this is a, and we put regular expression in to further constrain it. Then we'd say this must be no greater than 20% of this. So, we're providing information on this which is not available, that otherwise would be available in a schema. If this is ISO 2802 or FPML, we get the information for free. In a common delimited file, you don't get that information. Okay, so the jar is for the enrichment. Delta. So, yeah. yeah, so what we've got when we've, when we've defined this common delimited file and we say this currency represents the currency from ISO 2802, blah, 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 and that would then reference the ISO 2802 library. Um, this is all free, it's free to use, free to download, etc. Um, that would effectively generate Java code which would then be compiled and turn into a job. Okay, let's thank John here.